Happy Sabbath afternoon. What a beautiful day we've had. Lots of sunshine today. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, our Father God, we want to thank you again for this beautiful Sabbath day we get to enjoy today. And as we are still in the Sabbath hours, we pray in a special way for your continued blessings. And for those who have already left, we pray that you'll be with them. And uh, for those of us who are here, as we're getting ready to open the word, we pray again for the understanding of your word. What a time that we are living in right now. Lord, I pray for your protection. Uh, I pray that you will be with your people because we do need your divine intervention in our lives to protect us from the enemy. Forgive us, Lord, of all our sins, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, one of the reasons why I mentioned this in the prayer, what a time that we are living in right now, as I was uh, looking at some things, um, comparing them with the scriptures, we are living in a very, very dangerous world. Very, very wicked world. Now, what was once a crime is now the new normal. Now, I repeat that. What was once a crime is now the new normal. As a matter of fact, they are legislating lawlessness. They are legislating lawlessness. That's how bad things are in our world today. Which reminds me of judgment that we've been dealing with. Uh, for the past uh, couple of Sabbath at least, I think, which reminds me of, of the cup of iniquity. Those were the words that were playing on my mind. And there are many passages in the Bible where we read about men's cup of iniquity, of iniquity or their sins have reached unto heaven. Give me one passage. I think somebody was about to say something, but give me one passage. Revelation 14, third angel's message comes to my mind. Give me another one. Anybody uh, can come up with a passage that describes the cup of iniquities of men uh, to the brim? Which one? Well, yeah, Genesis 6, yes. What else? Uh, you said 17. 17 from which book? Revelation. What was that? <laughs> Jeremiah, I heard 17, chapter 17. What was the verse? Okay, okay. Okay, all right. Revelation 12, 17. I think that's describing something different. That says the dragon was rough with the woman and went to make war. Now, that is coming against God's people. That's a little bit uh, different than what I was asking. Uh, Revelation 18, verse 5, I believe it's, it describes, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Speaking of Babylon, yes, that's a very good word. I mean, a very good passage there. Revelation 18, verse 5. What else? Quiet in the house. <laughs> there are, well, let's go to Revelation 14. Let's read Revelation 14. Third angel's message, and it describes something similar that you just uh, quoted there from Revelation 18, 5. And the wickedness of men is so great in the land today that I believe God is about to pour out his wrath upon them. Read that out loud. Jeremiah 17, what? Right. 
Uh huh. What was the verse you read? You read there. Is it Jeremiah chapter seventeen? Verse nine. Okay. All right. Okay. So we go back to Revelation chapter fourteen now. Third angel's message. And the Bible says, in the third angel's message, it begins by saying, "What are the words we find there?" No, oh, that's another one. <laughs> it says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same, that's in verse 10 now, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. This is describing when men's sin, wickedness have come to the full. And it's about to get there, brothers and sisters. It's getting really bad out there. And as we mentioned Genesis 6, that's what God did. When men's sin and wickedness reach the top of this cup and that's what happened in the days of lot as well you see my brothers and my sisters we quoted or we read i should say second peter chapter 3 this morning which describes why god uh, holds back judgment upon man why do you remember it what was the reason because he is long suffering that he is not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance how long this world has been around for for about six thousand years right now six thousand years compared to men's life expectancy is that a long time or a short time that's a long time six thousand years that's a very very long time now this is describing the patience of God this is describing the long suffering of God. You see, God does not bring judgment upon men abruptly, instantly. No, He waits, He gives us opportunity, He is patient, He's reaching out to us. But there comes a time when God has to do something about the iniquity. Now, can somebody tell me one of the reasons why God has to do something about it before it gets even worse? Wait, repeat that? Okay, Matthew 24, yes, I'll take that. No saints, no God's people left, yes, okay. That's also the same passage there in Matthew 24, okay? But also, in addition to what you just said, remember this world is a theater. Remember that? This world is a theater. Paul says this. You have other worlds, unfallen beings, including the unfallen angels, that are watching the things that are transpiring here. And they also are asking questions now. How long will God allow this to continue? They are asking the same question now, brothers and sisters. After they witness what happened to the Son of God on the cross 2,000 years ago. This is the reason why, as we quoted Revelation 12, 11, which says, Class? <laughs> no, 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 no. I said, I said Revelation 12, 11. <laughs> and they overcame him by the blood of the land. And what else? By the words of their testimonies. And they loved their lives. They loved not their lives, rather, unto the death. And then we go to Revelation 12 now. Or 12, 12. The next verse. What does it say? Therefore rejoice ye heaven, and them which dwell there in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, 
For the devil has come down upon you because he knoweth, but he has but a short time. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. But meanwhile, heaven is at peace. Did you know, brothers and sisters, heaven was not at peace prior to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Heaven was not at peace. Can you tell me why heaven was not at peace? I'm, I'm referring to prior to the crucifixion. Prior to that. Yes. Yes, that's the answer. Because Satan still had access to the heavens. He still had access. Where can we find a passage like that? For the sake of time, I'm not going to take you there, but I'm just asking the question. Where, Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, both chapters. Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. Satan still had access to the heavens. Yes, sister. What do you mean by that, Pastor? That um, um, Satan still had access to the heavens. Did he not have access to it all this time? He doesn't have it now. That's why we just quoted Revelation 12 12. It says, Rejoice ye heaven and them that dwell therein. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come down upon you because he knoweth that he has but a short time. So what, hap what that passage there is saying is that if you, that's in chapter 12 of Revelation, by the way. If you go back to the very beginning of the chapter, you get the context. In the very beginning, it mentioned the birth of Jesus Christ, right? The very beginning of chapter 12 of Revelation. It described the birth of Jesus Christ and Satan trying to kill baby Jesus there. And, and then, of course, we know what happened. And then the saints gained the victory because over the uh, 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 Satan because Christ gained, gained the victory for them at the cross. At the cross, or let me back up to help you understand better. Prior to the cross, prior to Calvary, the unfallen world, including the unfallen angels, didn't fully understand the great controversy. The true characteristics of Satan were not really revealed to them. It's almost as if they were still trying to watch this movie play to see who is the good guy or who is the bad guy. But at the cross, when they saw what Satan did to the Son of God, then that's when they realized Satan's true nature. And this is the reason why Revelation 12, 12 again says, Rejoice ye heaven and them that dwell therein. At that moment, another thing happened when Jesus died on the cross. The access that Satan had, based on Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, the access that Satan had to the heavens was cut off. He could not go there if you go to job one it says there was a meeting somewhere in the heavens somewhere and satan appeared before god to represent the earth each world had a representative there representing them at that meeting and satan represented the earth adam should have been there to represent the earth but since satan was given dominion by adam adam forfeited the dominion that god gave him so Satan now represented the earth. So he still had access. And heaven was, uh, or wherever that meeting took place, he still had access there. So therefore there was not peace there. He was the accuser of the brethren. He kept going before God and accusing Job was a, a, uh, an example of that. And that's what the, the book of Job really was about. This great controversy, uh, Satan Accuse, accuses us before the Father. And so my brothers and my sisters, my Bible tells me at that moment, uh, Satan lost that ability to go and to harass those who did not fall into his sins and temptation. But now we, living on this earth, we are at the moment partly under the dominion of Satan but we do have a choice in the matter and the cup of wickedness is almost to the brim and about to overflow 
How will God deal with this? Now let me give you an example. Go to Genesis chapter 15 with me when it comes to the cup of iniquity. And there you also going to read about the long suffering of God. Genesis chapter 15. Uh, this is God uh, talking to Abraham and sharing a prophecy to Abraham and revealing something to him that Abraham was not going to experience, but his descendants were about to experience that. In uh, Genesis 15, and notice carefully with me, in uh, verse 13. Let me skip on that to verse 13. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for how long? For hundred years and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterward shall they come out with great substance now this is obviously referring to whom now that will come out with great substance the Israelites the descendants of Abraham and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace that shall be buried in a good old age but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again listen key words for the iniquity of the amorites is not yet full now god knew about the iniquities of the amorites but god was long suffering how long did they have here the amorites it was actually, an, in total, it was 430. Because if you read the same account here, Paul described here uh, that the law was given 430 years later after this prophecy was given. Paul said that. 430 years later after this prophecy was given to Abraham. That means when God, after God had brought them out of Egypt, they were now on Mount Sinai. Now... Having the law of God, God's principles, if a man live by them, they shall surely live, as God says. Now they were ready to conquer and to face those nations, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, and all the rest in righteousness. My brothers and my sisters, I think I mentioned this before here. God was using the Israelites as judges. To judge the nations in righteousness. This is the reason why uh, the harlot, uh, what was her name, uh, Rahab, the harlot uh, uh, said to them when they came to uh, Jericho, she said, I have heard the fame of you, what your God has done, how you have destroyed nations before you. Because at that time, the iniquity of the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Hevites were to the brim. And God was using his people there to bring judgment upon them. Now, it's no different today. Although God is not calling us to pick up swords and all of those weaponries and stuff like that to attack cities and fortresses or nations, but he has given us his words and as Paul described in Ephesians chapter 6, to put on the whole armor of God and to go and to judge the world in a righteousness. And to judge Babylon especially in righteousness. Because Babylon is responsible for all the abominations that are being done in the land. Now let's look at the fulfillment of this prophecy here. That would be in Exodus chapter 12. Where are we heading to? Exodus chapter 12. And notice in verse 40, and you, by reading this, you will remember what we just read in Genesis chapter 15. In Exodus chapter 12, there we find the fulfillment of this prophecy there. Beginning in verse 40, are you there? Amen. And the Bible says, in verse 40, Now the, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwell in Egypt was, what's the time was 430 years remember i mentioned it's exactly 430 years later that they were leaving egypt going into the promised land now can somebody tell me 
Why did God say to Abraham 400 years and then you have 430 years here? Is there a contradiction? I, I think the conflict started from Ur. Say, say it again. The conflict started from when he was in Mesopotamia. Yes, it wasn't there. It was it, when God gave the prophecy to Abraham. Very good. And in chapter 15 that it started. That was not the starting point. Did you hear the starting point? You're not sure? <laughs> Say it to them again. <laughs> Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. What happened there? No, no, no. That would take us back. <laughs> that would take us back. Because here, it, it, he was already out of Mesopotamia. I, I, wait, say that again? What happened there? Yeah, um, he, when, he, when he first left um, Ur, he stopped in Haran. Um, yeah. So his father died. Right. And then when he left, he had another call that came to his end. Right. Yeah, so, well, um, so I was saying that the talking starts from, from Mesopotamia because when he was in Haran, it was 10 years. Right, but also keep in mind, it describes from the moment that it, they enter. Egypt. Speaking of the descendants. Yeah. Speaking of the now, if you can look at the descendants after Abraham, whom do we have? Uh, Isaac. Isaac. And then Isaac, after Isaac, we have Jacob. Jacob. You have to take that into account as well. Yeah. And, and then they entered. It was Jacob, and then you have Joseph. It wasn't until Joseph came, that's when they enter. Enter the, the land of Egypt. Yes, correct. So Jacob was 130 then. Say that again? Jacob was 130 when he went into Egypt. Right. Right. From from, 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 from he went to Egypt to the town that they were led out of Israel, they led out of Egypt for about 215 years or 210 years. Wait, w repeat that again. When Jacob when Joseph presented Jacob to Mm -hmm. was Joseph was 130. Jacob was 130. Oh, Jacob. Okay, you got it now. So yeah. He, so from that time to the coming out was only about 200 years. Yeah, about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What time we're doing the math, right? <laughs> you know, that's, that's one of the things I like about the Bible. You see, in the Bible we have math, yeah. we have history, we have science. <laughs> Physics, we have everything. This is the reason why, you know, we, all we need is the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy to homeschool our children. That's all we need. Wait, I didn't hear that. Especially today. Especially today. Is it, that's why we have to have our school of, of the prophets. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let me go back here. So, we are in Genesis chapter 12, right? Genesis chapter 12, verse 14. Now, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of, from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. This was a day, a night that God was taking them out of a lawless nation, a tyrant, a dictatorship style of government. And today we have something very similar, brothers and sisters. And they have brought so many oppressions, so many things that are happening, taking place, that tells us that the same way God says, I'm going to bring my people to Abraham, that is, I'm going to bring my people out when the iniquities of the Amorites are fully ripe. Then I'm going to use my people to judge the wickedness, the lawlessness of those nations. 
That's the same thing God uh, has done when he raised up this movement, Seven Adventists, to judge the world in righteousness. Let me take you here on the screen. Notice what we read here from this website here. This is from uh, Natural News, September 13, 2022. Global rice shortage looms as India restricts experts of staple crop, unleashing global scarcity effects. Now read this carefully, because this is very serious. India's ban on rice expert is, not, is no laughing matter. Its experts topped a record 21.5 million tons in 2021. This surpassed the combined, notice the word combined there, shipments of world's next four biggest exporters of the staple crop. The US, Pakistan, Thailand, and Vietnam. The Hindu majority nation accounts for more than 40% of global rice shipments and exports rice to more than 150 countries my brothers and my sisters do the math think about this what that means to those at least 150 nations But do they care? No. Because they are being controlled by the papacy. They are, that's, what, that's a point that I'm making here. Because those nations are indulging, participating in the iniquity of Babylon. Yes, it came from Babylon. Yes, but they Right. Mm -hmm. so India is allowed to be used by well, them. this was the same case for the uh, Amorites, the Jezebites, the Jezebites and, uh, and the Canaanites and all the rest. They were being controlled and used by Satan. They had the evidences that God, Jehovah, was with the children of Israel. They had uh, the experience of the Egyptians. They, they, they knew, remember again, going back to Rahab the harlot, they, they had heard the fame of the children of Israel. How God brought them out of Egypt. How God manifested his power, ten plagues, to deliver them out of Egypt. They, those nations knew. They, they heard it. They even saw the evidences of what God has done to the Egyptian economy, and not just to the Egyptians' economy, but to the country itself. But yet... They hardened their heart against God, against God's people. Well, it's the same thing those nations are doing today. They are partaking of, with the papacy in his sin. This is why the, the Bible tells us, I believe it's in Revelation 18 as well, where it says that they will see her burning. And then they will realize then they were deceived by her. Is it chapter 17? Verse 18. Can you read that out loud for me? Are you sure it's 17, 18? No, I think it's 18. Yeah, I think it's chapter 18. I'm having a Bible class here. What, what's the verse? 18, 18. Say, read it for me, please. Yeah, yeah, that's that's part of it. Yep. Yeah, that. For those of you watching online, we're reading Revelation eighteen, eighteen, and nineteen. Let's add to that, if you back up to Revelation 18.9. Revelation 18.9 says, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her 
and lament for her, and when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. But, yeah, go ahead. Revelation 17, 16. Yeah, that's a very good passage there. there. Let, her and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her fire. Let, let me read that out loud, for, out loud for those watching online. Revelation 17, 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her de desolate, and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Because at that moment they realize that they have been deceived. But it's too late! It's too late. Judgment is already falling upon those nations. It's too late. Listen now. Did I finish? What we were reading on this? I didn't finish that, right? Okay, let's continue. It says the Hindu nation, I'm um, starting from the uh, center, middle part of it. The Hindu na uh, majority nation accounts for more than 40% of global rice shipments and exports rice to more than 150 countries. Any reduction in its shipments, which translates to less supply, would push already exorbitant food prices upward. Now, we are told here that India is responsible to feed 150 nations, at least, with its rice. 150 nations. Yet, my brothers and my sisters, at such a time as this, they have decided to stop the exportation. Why? Don't they care about their economy that will suffer as a result of this? Yes, the Jesuits are in full control. No, they don't care about that. Because also, another passage, I believe it's in Revelation 18. It puts all of those things into perspective. Let me find a verse here for you. That's in Revelation chapter 18. Uh, it describes right there for verse 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. In other words, what the governments are doing, like in this case, the government of India... The government is not suffering economically. They're not suffering. The people will suffer. The government, I read an article, what was it yesterday? I believe I read this article, where they said as a result of the world hunger, the famine that's going on right now, the banks, the elites, the globalists, last time something like that happened that came close to that profit that they're making, was 20 years ago but they're making 18 billion dollars profit as a result of the world hunger 18 billion dollars profit somebody's making a lot of money out of this it's yes they're making 18 billion dollars profit they're making and they're bragging about it as a result of the world hunger the same way they were bragging about how much money they were making as a result of the lockdowns like the CEO, the Zoom CEO. He was a millionaire, and as a result of the pandemic, he became a billionaire because everybody was on Zoom now. You see? Again, that takes me back to, what is it, James chapter 5, I believe it is, talking about the rich, what they're doing to the poor. What was that? Did somebody say something? So it's, it's, it's also saying that the, the, the civil war is a we, yes, but is that, well, I'm, I'm partly going there. I'm partly going there. Because when there's a food crisis, a food shortage, people rise up. But at the same time, they're trying not to have the people to rise up. They're giving the people a substitute. Listen to this one. This says, WEF endorsed bugs and insects force fed to children in 1,000 plus Australian schools. School children 
at more than 1,000 Australian schools are being fed a diet of bugs and crickets and taught to consider the snacks to be the new normal. Children are now consuming new generation chips, crisps, and snacks laced with eco, quote unquote, eco-friendly cricket protein made by Circle Harvest as Klaus Schwab's vision of the future is rolled out in Australia. They're giving the people a substitute. That's Babylon. Babylon diet there. Abominable things. Listen now. He goes on to say, however, experts warn that insects are not safe for human consumption. Insects contain chitin, which cannot be processed by the human gastrointestinal system. Chitin is a polysaccharide, which is very tasty to cancer, parasites, fung, what now? Fungi, and pretty much any other cause of illness in humans. Insects also contain metamorphic steroids, especially ecdysteroids, Steroid, only birds can process insects safely. Now, my brothers and my sisters, we were in Portugal, brother Eddie and I, we were in Portugal a few weeks ago. And uh, they went to, to the store and they sent me, me pictures. I, I didn't go to the store, but they went to the store and they sent me pictures of what they saw over there. They said, Pastor, what you were talking about it, we were seeing it at the store. There were those chips there being advertised. Bugs, crickets, chips, and all of those things. Right there. So, so, so these things are going to cause our box, sister wives of Sassar's cities desolate. Mm -hmm. so yep. These things are going to kill people. Remember, they're using every tool at their disposal by every mean, by every way, to depopulate the earth. Yeah. Listen to, to the next one here. This says, danger, mega companies are quickly but quietly adding bugs to our foods as the media and celebrities attempt to do what? Normalize worms as food for Americans' dark communist future. This normalization of bugs as food is a tactic for combating the rise in costs of goods and uh, our emerging energy crisis. That's a substitute. All under the guise of healthy and environmental reasons. Those pushing this new normal will start with something like grasshoppers. Listen carefully. I want you to, to listen to what they are telling us here. And then you're going to see where this is going to lead us to. It starts with what again? Grasshopper. And then they will move towards normalizing the far more out there alternatives. Like what now? Cockroach, Cockroach milk. Well, if you don't think that this is happening, now keep in mind, as they are promoting this, we go from, let's say, crickets, and uh, grasshoppers to cockroach milk, then it's going to go somewhere else. Speaking of cockroach milk, this says here, cockroach milk, a promising superfood or nothing but hype. Recently, cockroach milk has been coined as an up-and-coming superfood as it's said to be incredibly nutritious and quote-unquote healthy. Scientists have discovered that this milk-like crystalline substance is nutritious and considered a complete food, as it's a good source of protein, carbs, and fats. Additionally, cockroach milk is considered a complete protein source as it provides all nine essential amino acids, the building blocks of protein that can only be attained through your diet. This is how they are promoting this, advertising it. It's good for your health. Lots of proteins, lots of carbs. Doesn't matter if you want to lose weight, well, it's good for you. If you want to 
Gain weight? Well, it's good for you. Uh, what's that? Yeah, anything, anything, it's good for you. You want to die tomorrow, it's good for that too. Yes, it's good for all of that. Doesn't matter. You want to be constipated, that's good too. Or diarrhea, or <laughs> don't mention it, it's super good for that too. It, yeah, it, well, remember, follow the science. It's a twisted science. Yeah. It's Babylon science. Let's move on. It goes on to say, this fact is important because most non-meat foods lack one or more of the nine essential amino acids, which is why cockroach milk has gained buzz as a non-dairy milk alternative. Well, it has all of those things that the regular meat does not have. That's what they're saying here. My brothers and my sisters, is it by coincidence that we see them attacking the farmers, stopping them from raising cattle? As a matter of fact, I read an article yesterday in India where it says they killed about 50,000 cows in just one slaughter, one day, and then blame it on this virus. But it's not just in India, it's happening in other places. It's happening all over the world. Because remember what they say, the reason why they are getting rid of the cows and they don't want the farmers to raise cattle anymore is because they say cows are polluting the planet with carbon dioxide. Well, today it's cows. Tomorrow it's going to be whom now? Listen to what Spirit of Prophecy tells us here. The history of Daniel and his companions when it comes to food has been recorded on the pages of the inspired word for the benefit of the youth of all succeeding ages. What men have done, men may do. Did those youthful Hebrews stand firm amid great temptations and bear a noble testimony in favor of true temperance? The youth of today may bear a similar testimony the lesson here presented is one which we would do well to ponder. Our danger is not from scarcity. What is our danger? Where will we find that? But from abundance. We are constantly tempted to excess. Those who would preserve their powers unimpaired for the service of God must observe strict temperance in the use of his bounties as well as total abstinence from every injurious or what else debasing indulgences well my brothers and my sister there's nothing new under the sun Babylon had chosen a specific diet for Daniel and the three Hebrew boys and the rest Today, Babylon has chosen a specific diet for you and I. My brothers and sisters, do you see the comparison here? Do you see how the prophecies are repeating themselves? Yeah. Babylon, yeah, yes, history is repeating itself. Babylon had chosen under penalty of death a diet for the children of Israel. It's no different today. Will there be a faithful few standing up? Let's continue. He goes on to tell us. The rising generation are surrounded with alarmants calculated to tempt the appetite, especially in our large cities. Every form of indulgence is made easy and inviting. Those who, like Daniel, refuse to defile themselves will reap the reward of their temperate habits with their greater physical stamina and increased power of endurance they have a bank of i like this one listen now they have a bank of deposit upon which to draw in case of emergency now speaking of daniel you know what the song says right speaking of daniel dare to be a daniel now remember we will not have a choice in the matter as Babylon is enforcing its diet upon us. We will not have a, a choice in the matter. The same way Daniel and his friends, at least on the surface, seemed like they did not have a choice. But in their heart, 
Did they have a choice? What men could not see, they knew. They had it. And today, we have to show the same thing. That we do have a choice. That the Most High God liveth. Just like uh, people ask me sometimes back then. Even people got angry with me <laughs> for doing so. How will you manage? How did you manage to travel without taking the poison? I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, I don't travel to do my own thing, my own pleasure. I'm, I'm a missionary. I go where God bids me. And so if he tells me to go, I'll, I can travel without that. How did you do it? You got on a flight without wearing the mask during the pandemic? How did you do it? I did it. <laughs> I tell you, I was at the um, um, Perth, Perth, Australia's uh, international airport, flying from Perth to Sydney, Australia. This was January 2021. I remember January 2021, we were in the midst of this thing. I was the only one at the airport not wearing the mask. As a matter of fact, the, um, I had a police officer helping me <laughs> with my luggages because this was not long after I had the surgery on my foot. I couldn't pick up heavy things. I had a police officer and he was wearing the mask and I didn't have the mask on. And the whole time, I, I literally felt like I was an alien at the airport. I, no, I'm not kidding you. I literally felt like I was an alien because everybody was staring at me. And some of, the, of those faces were angry because they didn't want to wear the mask, but they had it on. And I, I, I wasn't wearing it. They, and then the lady at the counter, I was, I was there for maybe 15 minutes. She said nothing. And then all of a sudden she said to me, Oh, sir, you don't have a mask on. And I'm thinking to myself, you just realized that? <laughs> and then, and then he, she said, oh, let me give you a mask. I said, no, I don't wear a mask. She said, oh, okay. <laughs> I got on the flight. I got on the flight. Uh, one of the flight attendants, she was very nice. Uh, she, she said, uh, the whole time she was talking to me, talking, and then she also realized I didn't have a mask. And then she, she came up, she said, oh, you need a mask? I said, no, I don't wear a mask. I, I can't, I breathe in that. And then she said, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I landed uh, uh, um, in uh, Sydney, Australia. Same thing. And then from, after spending two months in Sydney, then I flew from there to, to, to back to the U.S. I landed in, what, what was it, Los Angeles, I think it was. I mean, in America, it was bad over there. Somebody can jump at you if you're not wearing the mask. Now, keep in mind, this was January. No, when I got to U.S., it was March now, March 2021. At the airport, I was the only one not wearing masks. Man, there were angry people looking at me. Do we believe that God is still, on the, uh, is still sitting on the throne? Yes. Do we believe that all things are possible with God? God wants to use us to judge the nations. Just like brothers and sisters, Daniel and his friends on those two, well, three occasions, Daniel 1, Daniel 3, Daniel 6, it seemed like there was no way they could go against the laws of the land and not to do what was being enforced upon them. Uh, but did they serve their God? And did God come through for them? I was ready, willing to go to prison than to wear that muzzle. That's what I said. I said, as a matter of fact, my first attempt, I tried to leave Australia to go to U.S., but uh, they tried to get me to wear the mask. I said, Lord, if you want me to go to the U.S., I, I'm not going to wear the mask. That's what I said. I said, if you want me to go to, wear, to, to the U.S., I'm not going to wear the mask. So I stayed in Australia. Uh, I, I ended up staying in Sydney, and then I did a lot of work there in Sydney. I did several baptisms there in Sydney. And then after my work there was done, then the Lord said, okay, now it's time to go to the U.S. And then now there was no problem. Amen. There was no problem. God opened the door for me to go to the U.S. And my brothers and my sisters, 
How do we judge the world? Well, I give you some examples, my own personal testimony. And uh, based on Daniel chapter 6, Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 1. That's how we judge the world in righteousness. Amen. When everybody is being forced to do this, as long as you know that it will, it will violate your conscience and the laws of God, then you stand up. Amen. You stand up. Because the, their wickedness will not end. You yield to one of their demons, then they will take another step. They will demand something else. Speaking of that, notice on the screen with me. This is from the activist post, September 15, 2022. WEF, World Economic Forum, listen carefully to what they are telling you here, is pushing carbon allowance surveillance system to track personal emissions. My brothers and my sisters, do you understand what that means? To track your personal emissions? It's, let's put it this way. They have already desensitize us with the pandemic with curfews remember curfews this is what this, this is talking about here you will be limited on how much activities you can do they've already give you the dress rehearsal the pandemic with curfews lockdowns and so on now keep in mind this has to also something to do with how much carbon dioxide you can exhale into the atmosphere. Let's go back to the screen. The World Economic Forum is publishing ideas about yet another reason or excuse to deploy more surveillance technology. This time, it's climate change and specifically monitoring carbon emissions. Monitoring carbon emissions? Now, we're not talking about carbon emissions from a factory over there, from a, a plant factory or building over there, or from animals. We're talking about human beings. Let's continue. At the individual level, the plan is to use surveillance tech to track in detail personal carbon emissions along with giving individuals advisories on lower carbon. How are you going to give me advice or notice on how I should lower my personal carbon emission? It's like WEF is going to tell you, die a little bit more, die, D die. I mean, this is what they, they, they wickedness brothers and sisters. Let's continue. Along with giving individual advisories on lower carbon and ethical choices for consumption of product and services. Do you see it? Consumption. You see the word consumption? Then in other words, they're going to tell you that you cannot eat that because that is causing carbon emission. That's what, that's what this is talking about. Let's continue. It says, further, Cost for carbon intensive activities, notice activities, carbon intensive activities, and goods should be increased while offering economic incentives to reduce demand. Bribery, another way of saying low carbon emission social credit system. Oh, brothers and sisters, give me one word. What is that? What that means? where it says low carbon emission social credit sy system. One word. Let, let me... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hear money, murder, reset. Okay. <laughs> uh, those, are, those are good applications as well. But let's go... Well, not literally go there, but Revelation 13, 16. If you read that, the word I'm looking for is there. It's slavery, brothers and sisters. Read it one more time. Let's go back to the screen. It says, another way of saying, low carbon emission social credit system. What is social credit system? Huh? 
It's not just your money. Remember, it says social credit system. Social. Control your activities, everything about you. Then you get points based on your behavior. Yes. You get rewarded, so to speak. If you go along, you eat the crickets, the bugs, you get, oh, 1,000 points. That's what this is talking about. Let's move on. It goes on to say, and then creating new social norms is also recommended. These would impose a new definition of what a fair share of personal emissions is and set acceptable levels of personal emissions. What does that mean? If we were to um, summarize what we just read here, well, let's use Spirit of Prophecy to help us here. Vivian Herald, September 17, 1901. Men have reached a point in insolence and disobedience, which shows that their cup of iniquity is almost full. Many have well nigh passed their boundary of mercy. Soon, God will show that he is indeed the living God. He will say to the angels, no longer combat Satan in his efforts to destroy. Let Satan work out his malignity upon the children of disobedience. For the cup of their iniquity is full. They have advanced from one degree of wickedness to another, adding daily to their lawlessness. I will no longer, God says, interfere to prevent the destroyer from doing his work. Run, brothers and sisters, to Jesus Christ before God uh, allows Satan to have such power. Right now, the angels are still holding back the winds of strife, a little bit at least. But soon and very soon, we're going to see wickedness like we've never seen them before. As a matter of fact, this reminds me, let me take you to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Where are we heading to? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Notice what we read there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. As I stated from the beginning, we are living in a very, very dangerous world. Listen, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, are you there? And the Bible says in verse 16, Notice carefully, 1 Thessalonians chapter, let me back up to get some context. Verse 14, for ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, lawlessness there who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophet and have persecuted us and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. To fill up their sins? What does that mean? To fill up their sins. It's talking, talking about the cup of iniquity. That's a cup of iniquity. That's a wickedness, lawlessness. And then it says, For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. So the cup of iniquities, whenever we, we read such language in the Bible, then it always followed by the judgment of God. And my brothers and my sisters, lawlessness, as Spirit of Prophecy says here, is now the law of the land. Somebody sent this to me, and... Uh, I just wanted to, I just screenshot it and put this on the slides for you. Listen, this is in the United States of America. Speaking of lawlessness, how they are legalizing lawlessness. This says uh, Illinois, the state of Illinois in America. Illinois, non-detainable offenses beginning January 1st, 2023. Notice again, let's read the headline. Non-detainable offenses beginning January 1st, 2023. What do they consider now as non-detainable offenses that will begin in America, in Illinois, in January 1st, 2023? There's the list. Aggravated battery, aggravated DUI, aggravated fleeing, the police, 
from the police, arson, burglary, drug-induced homicide, intimidation, kidnapping, robbery, second-degree murder, threatening a public official. By January 1st, 2023, this will be a non, or these would be, will be a non-detainable offenses. And now don't tell me, brothers and sisters, we're not repeating the experience of the French Revolution again. That's how it was, brothers and sisters. Read Revelation chapter 11, and also Daniel chapter 11, about the French Revolution. Lawlessness. Let's read what Spirit of Prophecy says here. Ministry of Healings, page 444, paragraph 5. As revolutions are predicted, and all manner of proceedings described that break down the barriers of law and self-restraint, many catch the spirit of these representations. They are led to the commission of crimes even worse, if possible, than these sensational writers depict. Through such influences as these, society is becoming demoralized. The seeds of what? Lawlessness are sown broadcast. None need marvel that a harvest of crime is the result of what? A harvest of crime. So what must we expect? I watched a video that somebody sent me a couple days ago, I believe it was. And there were many videos like that where this guy in America, in broad daylight, he's just, he, he's just walking out of the gym. And then three young men with guns came out of this vehicle and tried to rob him. And there was another one, this lady, broad daylight in her neighborhood. This car pulled, pulled up. And they tried to rob her. They got her on the floor and trying to rob her. Screaming. And the police were told not to get involved. Yes, in Illinois. The police were told not to get involved. And what's coming? More lawlessness. Well, where will it end? No wonder, brothers and sisters, now they are promoting the eating of human beings. Listen to this one here. WEF advisor Yoel Harari ponders how the world will deal with useless people. He said, Yoel Harari, an Israeli philosopher who served as an advisor to the World Economic Forum, has frequently warned of a growing class of useless people in order to address the growing number of so-called useless people. Harari suggests keeping them docile with drugs and video games. Well, there's another way they're doing this. As we've covered last time from this article, from this website, Human Meat Project, People for People. They say, the practice of cannibalism is not uncommon in living beings in both the animal kingdom and our human history. The consumption of one's own species has existed in order to save the planet from the impact of our modern civilization and lifestyle. We have to make a change in our ideas about consumption and our dietary choices. We face climate change due to waste pollution, deforestation, and overpopulation problems. Now, for those of you who were there last Sabbath afternoon, what was the solution to that? Well, as the website says, Human Meat Project. Now, I'm going to read something for you from the same website I did not read last time. It says, end date and harvest time. Remember, they're asking for human to donate their bodies for human consumption. Remember that? It says here from the website, end date and harvest time. Sometimes, if a donor a donor that's donating their bodies to be eaten? If a donor is fully committed to donating their body to the society, we can give them an end date service. For an end date service, a donor can choose any date they want to be harvested. And date services are our way of allowing donors 
to make important arrangements and have time to live their life up until the date they choose to be harvested. Lawlessness, brothers and sisters. Lawlessness. Now, I would like for you to keep in mind, this is nothing new. They've been doing this in secret. Or it's just now they are normalizing it. They've been doing this in secret. Just like they've been putting, uh, we've been, uh, they've been uh, using sewage water. But now they are telling you, well, that's what we're going to do. Remember, Satan is behind all of that. It's a spiritual warfare. Their website goes on to say, when the end date is near, they will be called, the donors will be called, in for health and physical evaluations. The Human Meat Project will provide what? Spiritual and religious service. If the donor is spiritual or religious, the donor is also allowed to call in their personal spiritual or religious guidance. We believe that by giving these services, we can help the donor to have a peaceful death and produce better quality meat. <laughs> Do you see how wicked the, the heart is? Just like that, brothers and sisters. Like it's no more. It's not a big deal. It's like killing a cow, a chicken, or something like that. Let's move on. It says, end date and harvest time. Our donors will be taken care of by our specialized team to make sure they are treated with full respect and care while they are devouring them. Donors will be prepared emotionally and physically to enter the harvest room. Donors will be given time to spend their last moment as a person before they become human meat. The donor will then be assisted in a painless and peaceful method of passing away, after which we will immediately begin to harvesting procedure and harvest the donor body and or organs. What's the peaceful way? Very good question. What is peaceful about knowing that they are killing you to harvest your body, to eat you up? Remember last time they say that the person has to be healthy, as we cover. The person shouldn't have cancer and all kinds of other disease they mentioned. The person has to be, well, let's put it this way, a person that has not taken the poison, a person that maybe who is uh, plant-based, oh, maybe that person should be a seven Adventist. They're coming after us, brothers and sisters. Let's move on. It goes on to say, over time, why donate? That's a question they ask here. Why donate your body? That's what they're asking. Over time, the human population has increased rapidly across the globe, leading to a higher demand for food, especially meat products. Products With this increasing demand, land for residential areas has become more difficult to find. And what else? What's the word? Emissions from farms have risen every year, making the lives we lead less sustainable. So why donate your body to be harvested? To save the planet. That's what they just said here. And you know what, brothers and sisters? People have been so detached, deceived, and many will accept that. And they will walk into this harvest room to donate their body. Because they believe in their mind that they are helping the planet. Let's continue. No, that's a waste of time. Very good. Yeah, yes. Well, remember, if you, if, you, if you have those diseases that they listed, if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, they might not eat you, but they'll kill you. So it doesn't matter. Let's continue. We believe that by donating bodies and or organs, we can make a change by creating alternative meat consumption options while addressing the value of a person's body. Seriously, 
Oh, my brothers and my sisters, we are dealing with the carnal mind. Yes, thank you very much. This is sacrificing human beings to their gods. It's Baal worship, as you said. Listen, we are dealing with the carnal mind. Go to Romans chapter 8 with me. Those people are at war with God. Remember again, God says, this is good to eat. Satan came and says, no, this is good to eat. Go ahead and eat it. Listen to what Paul says. This is a spiritual warfare, brothers and sisters. Chapter 8 of Romans. And the Bible tells us, verse 6, it says, for, the carnal, for, the, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of what? Righteousness. Do we see the wickedness in the world? So what does the world need to see right now? Righteousness, brothers and sisters. Many are heading to the slaughterhouse the same way many were led voluntarily to the slaughterhouse and took the Babylonian poison. First, that's what they did. Now they're telling you to go now to offer your body to be eaten, to save the planet because of climate change. I would not be surprised for such wickedness. I would not be surprised if now some mandates would come and say, we're going to put you on lockdowns unless some of you come out and either kill yourself or be eaten. I would not be surprised, brothers and sisters, because that's a climate lockdown. But it gets even worse than that. To make this thing fancier, to appeal to the carnal mind of men, listen to what this next website tells us here. By the name of Bite. Labs. It says, eat celebrity what now? Meat. Eat what? Celebrity meat. Bite Labs produces fine artisanal salami from meat that has been lab grown from celebrity tissue samples. Today, in a vitro meat production is close to becoming a reality, offering highly controllable meat production without the animal cruelty waste and environmental impacts of industrial farming. But this process can offer so much more than replicas of beef and pork. Oh, if you eat a celebrity meat tissue, then you will be able not to fly like Superman. Because celebrities, hey, hey, who doesn't want to be or to become a celebrity? Think about this. That's one of the ways they are training people to eat other people, to normalize the eating of human beings. Now, if you eat the, the celebrities meat tissue, think about that. Those celebrities, they have millions of followers, if not billions of followers. And uh, some of those celebrities, you have people that have been trying to imitate them. I read this article a long time ago where this, this lady went through, she paid thousands and thousands of dollars because she wanted to look like, what's the act actress name? Angelina Jolie? She wanted to look like Angelina Jolie. And so she went under this plastic surgery. Now think about that. Now they are offering you the meat tissue of those celebrities. Think about that for a moment. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. There's nothing, 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 nothing that will stop. Now think about that. 
They will spend millions of dollars to look like a celebrity. They will do anything to be like that celebrity. Now, imagine eating the flesh of that celebrity or the tissue of that celebrity. Ooh, you feel like now this celebrity is in you. The website went on to say, Help get celebrities on board. Let's tell the world we want to eat celebrity meat. Do you see the wickedness, brothers and sisters? Listen to what Spirit of Prophecy went on to tell us here. Acts of the Apostles, pages 219 and 220. At the present time, when the end of all things earthly is rapidly approaching, Satan is putting forth desperate efforts to ensnare the world. He is devising many plans to occupy minds and to divert attention from the truths essential to salvation. Wickedness is reaching a height never before attained. And yet, many ministers of the gospel are crying peace and safety. But God's faithful messengers are to go steadily forward with their work. Clothed with the panoply of heaven, they are to advance fearlessly and victoriously, never ceasing their warfare until every soul within their reach shall have received the message of truth for this time. My brothers and my sisters, as many are looking unto the celebrities and are being deceived, where should we be looking to? Let me take you to Isaiah as we're coming to a close. Isaiah chapter 45. Where are we heading to? Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 45. Wickedness, brothers and sisters. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some passages with you here. And to bring this to a conclusion here. Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah says... In verse 20, assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escape of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together who have declared this from ancient time, who have told it from at that time. Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me, the Bible says, and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. None else. There's no other way out of this madness that we are in right now except through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking of look unto me, Numbers. Let's go to Numbers. Numbers chapter 21. Go backward to the book of Numbers, chapter 21. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, that's what the world needs right now. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Numbers chapter, one, chapter 21, and the Bible says, verse 8, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a what? Fiery serpent, and set it up upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he, what happened? He lived. And what does that represent? John chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus says, remember John chapter 3, we covered part of that this morning. This was the same dialogue that Jesus had with Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. It's the same chapter as well that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But now we're in verse 14. John chapter 3, verse 14. What does it say there? It's going to echo what we just read in the book of Numbers. John chapter 3, verse 14. Do you see it? And the Bible says, Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, 
even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the message we have right now. That is the righteousness message, which also declares that the judgment of God is near. Because as you continue to read, Jesus says, even right here in verse 14, he said that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It describes the judgment of God. It describes the love of God. It describes the righteousness of God, the long-suffering of God. It describes you and I living in these last days. The third angel's message, the cup of iniquity of the world is almost to the brim because of this partnership with the papacy. We only have one final cry, one final message. And that message, as Revelation 18.1 says, let's quote that and then we end. What does it say there? Again. That would be Isaiah 60, you started to quote there. But I mentioned Revelation 18.1. We quote, we quote that and we're done. What does it say there? And after these, I saw another angel came down with great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. In what context that we read that passage there? That passage is there for. In what context? It is in the context of the cup of iniquities of Babylon is about to be poured out and God is about to bring judgment upon Babylon. That is in that context. And who is that angel? Who is that angel? What does that angel represent? Or whom does that angel represent? Mm, let's try that one more time. <laughs> uh, a few of you said Jesus. Uh, I, 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 I know you mean well, but, uh, <laughs> but let's back up. No. The, 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 what was that? Yes. The word, what is the word angel in the Greek? It's angelos, which means messenger. That's you and I. That takes us again to summarize, to wrap up everything. God said to Abraham that after 400 years, I'm going to deliver your descendants. And because at that time, the sins of the Amorites shall be full. Their cup of iniquity shall be full. And the children of Israel were raised up as judges to preach a righteousness by faith message. Did you know that? It was a righteousness by faith message. They were going to a land that they had never seen before. It took faith. They were going through the wilderness. It took faith to believe that God was going to provide for them. Just like us, brothers and sisters. We have a message that is a righteousness by faith to judge the world because their cup is almost full. But God still has some children in Babylon. The same way Rahab. Remember that. <laughs> Who was she? She was a harlot. She was not an Israelite. But she had a fear of God. And as the children of Israel were on their way to the promised land, they were to proclaim the righteousness of God, judging the world. And those who have opened their hearts to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter who they were. They were accepted. Now, by the way, when you look at the genealogies, did you know that Rahab is part of the genealogies? That harlot? Imagine that. It tells you, brothers and sisters, that God can do mighty things with you if you will only humble yourself. That harlot was bound for destruction. She humbled herself. She confessed her, her sins. And she accepted the God the true God who was leading the children of Israel. Amen. My brothers and my sisters, as we mentioned this morning, the 11th hour message, that woman, what saved 
at the 11th hour. What about us in the church, brothers and sisters? We have a message. It is that righteousness by faith message to give to the world, to warn them of the impending judgment that's coming. Let's have a word of prayer. Our loving God, Father, which art in heaven, uh, Father, help us to, as we read this morning, fall on the rock. And it also means to have your own way in us. Just like your word says, you are the potter, we are the clay. Help us, Lord. We want you to mold us, to shape us in whatever fashion, whatever form that you see fit. Help us not to be in control of our lives. We want you to be in control, in full control. Because we can see the wickedness that is ravaging the world right now and is increasing. We can only find shelter as we surrender all to Jesus Christ. Forgive us of all our sins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.